Um, I'm now going to give uh, the floor to Anna Lewis, who's going to comment uh, on your presentation. I just have to find her in the list of okay. people. Okay, so good morning. Um, and I could see you. Can you see me? Yes, we can see you. Okay. Thank you. So um, my name is Anna Lewis, and I'm a computer scientist with a specialization in high performance computing and working for the high performance computing platform of the Human Brain Project. Um, I would like to comment on Peter's very interesting talk um, linking between what the HPP is doing and what the HPP could deliver to uh, in the development of intelligent machines. So it's obvious that the Human Brain Project isn't installing cameras and we are not uh, buying UAVs, we are not trying to analyze the internet, but um, there is the, the Human Brain Project is not just simulating the human brain, but we're doing much more and we develop technology. And I'm wondering um, and how far this technology could be used for um, improving intelligent machines and making them more intelligent. So the Human Brain Project tries to understand the brain and how it works. And we want to find the differences between normal brains and diseased brains, um, and maybe even ways how to um, heal diseases like Alzheimer's disease or dementia, um, or at least to slow down the disease process. Um, and the way to get there over the 10-year duration of the project is to gather a lot of data, combine it into atlases, map all different um, modalities onto each other, um, use these huge data sets to model the brain better than we can do today, and finally, to simulate the brain based on these models. And for all of that, we need a lot of technology. And that technology development is also part of the Human Brain Project. So we have supercomputers already now available for uh, image processing, for data analysis, and for modeling and simulation. And the Human Brain Project has a big influence on the development of future supercomputers. So we are in contact with uh, vendors world-leading vendors of supercomputers uh, to get exactly the next generation of supercomputers that we need for doing what we want to do. Um, other groups are developing neuromorphic devices uh, that can be used for some very specific use cases um, to accelerate simulations and to make our simulations much more energy efficient. And we do research on neurorobotics, for, which is necessary for functional studies for cognitive neuroscience use cases. So we do much more than just measuring the brain and simulating the brain. And I was wondering when I had a slide at uh, a look at Peter's slides yesterday, what happens if the human brain project succeeds in all these in all these different methods? So uh, what if we can simulate large neuro neural networks um, up to the size of a full human brain? Um, if they are realistic in the sense that they really mimic what the human brain is doing. Um, how could these networks be used to control robots or parts of robots that could be virtual or physical robots? Um, what if we have neuromorphic chips that are so densely integrated that um, they can be used in robots uh, to make robots more intelligent, actually? because th these devices are designed to uh, simulate neural networks. So this is all a far way to go, but what if this all becomes true? Uh, I think the, the Human Brain Project could play a role in the development of, well, the intelligence of intelligent machines and robots. Uh, if we deliver, for example, neuromorphic chips that fit into robots for um, providing them with intelligence or um, we could also provide the theory which is necessary to uh, improve artificial intelligence algorithms um, that could have many positive effects. So we could have robots that can do surgery all on them, all themselves. So, for example, brain surgery where millimeters or even fractions of millimeters really make a difference for the patient. Um, it would be perfect if that could be done by robots instead of human beings. Um, there are many more use cases for robots where it's just to um, 
yeah, too dangerous for humans, like um, removing bombs or deactivating them. And if the robots are not just remotely controlled by humans, but if they can make decisions on their own, they could be perfect in some cases. But there are also many negative effects, like, like mentioned by Peter. So what about robots that are so intelligent that they can fight in wars? Um, what if um, the gap between the rich and the poor gets even larger because the rich can afford intelligent robots and the poor can't? So there are many um, ethical and social impacts of uh, improving robots and intelligent machines. And when projects like the Human Brain Project should really think about which role they could play in this development. So dual use is already an issue today in other communities. In the high-performance computing world, um, it is very obvious. So the supercomputers can be used for simulating the universe, but they can also be used to by Google for uh, being our big brother watching us. And I think we now reached the, the state where Google knows more about us than we than our best friends, well, depending on what we provide about us online. And there are many more, even worse use cases than Google. So uh, dual use is something which we should, which have to be considered right from the beginning, even if it's today just a dream that we reach all our goals in the Human Brain Project. It could be that there are implications we can't even imagine today. Um, and I'm, I'm here also as a young scientist. Um, and being a young t scientist means that I'm hopefully going to live in this world for many decades. And technology is changing and developing very fast. So it, it will be interesting to see in how far the work we are doing today will, influence, will have an influence on our world. Just as an example, the Commodore 64 was released only a few years before my birth, which was a major step into the direction of doing our work more efficiently and faster. The first notebook was available when I was, well, the first affordable notebooks were available when I was at primary school, which allows us to take our work with us and to work more closely with colleagues. We can just take our work with us, meet them in another room and, and show them something. The first smartphone, well, the first iPhone was released in my last year at school, which has had a huge impact on our social life. So the development of social networks was highly influenced by smartphones. And that all happened within basically two centuries. So I'm really wondering what will happen in the future uh, with respect to robots and intelligent machines and which role the Human Brain Project and the, in particular the technology development and the uh, the brain theory, will, which role it will play in this, this whole process. Okay, and thank you very much for all your uh, insightful uh, comments. I'm going to give the floor first to uh, Peter to see if he uh, would like to uh, respond to some of the things that you said. Sure. Um, I guess I'm a little bit skeptical about how much or how applicable advanced brain modeling and neuromorphic chips will be to advance many of the projects that at least intelligent machines are working on now. Because I think they're very application specific. And I think if the brain project is highly successful, what you wind up with is a, is a very general model of how the brain works, uh, rather than how specific tasks or specific kinds of expertise actually function. Um, but there, I think there's an interesting case uh, specifically about brain surgery and surgery in particular because there's now a growing use of robotic systems for teleoperated surgery, uh, in particular the da Vinci system, where you have an expert surgeon who controls these micro manipulators <clears throat> in order to perform surgery. And what's very interesting about that is you can basically collect all of the data um, from all of the surgeries. So right now, we don't really know how a surgeon performs a surgery, right? That knowledge is sort of tied up in the hands of surgeons, and it's really embodied in the muscles and neurons of surgeons, and it's very hard to get out. Um, but instead of actually modeling the neurons of surgeons, what we have is a robotic, telerobotic system 
and we get all of the physical manipulation inputs from a surgeon. Now, surgeries are different, so you need a lot of data, a lot of surgeries before you can start to figure out how to create an algorithm that can essentially replicate what the best surgeons would do in certain situations uh, with new patients and new conditions, things like that. So I think there is there there are routes to this, um, and sometimes they come through the material artifact as much as just from sort of modeling things directly. And I think a lot of that is also going to be in this at the sort of behavioral level of as these systems, and if you have these neuromorphic chips and advanced neural modeling techniques of being able to learn things about specific users um, based on their digital sort of activity or observing them, so a robot observing us or using advanced sensors and things like that, but that it can learn in a very small, much more, much fewer number of examples. Right now, AI requires that you have huge data sets and lots of examples to learn things. I think advanced you know, neural modeling is going to allow, because people learn things in very few instances. So once we figure out how people do that, I think there could be a pretty big leap in AI technology. Anna, do you have uh, immediately uh, any comments? So Peter said that um, we are, uh, he's not so sure about the, well, and how far our our research will have influence on robots. But so the Human Brain Project is also working on. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. The yeah. Human Brain Project is also doing research on cognitive neuroscience. So um, feedback loops with like the visual motor cortex. And um, I mean, it. I was really look, thinking about what could happen in ten or fifteen years, not in the next two or three. Um, I think it's it's important that we think about all potential things that might happen, uh, just to be prepared for how to treat them when it happens. Peter? Yeah. No, I, know. I, mean, I agree. With, um, so take on it. Yeah. 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 That expertise. I think is an interesting question. But I, I think the, the brain and behavioral stuff, as you look at people's behavior and being able to infer things from that, I mean, that's, that's already being done. And I think all, all of that research is going to continue to make that more successful. OK. So I also have uh, some audience questions. And we, of course, we have a, a large audience listening to to your presentations, the commentary, and, and your uh, discussion. So if it's okay with you, I would like to introduce some of the audience questions at this moment. So, so one question is from uh, Professor Nicholas Rose. I'm going to read it uh, uh, out loud because um, Nicholas, of course, he can't say he has a throat infection. So uh, this uh, is a question to Peter Asaro. Uh, regarding your last comment, so there's a lot of work in the social sciences on the role of tacit knowledge, as in the example of surgeons, but this requires continual micro-adjustment of the person to the details of every specific situation. Is it really possible for autonomous machines to replicate this? Yeah, I, I think that's very challenging, and I think I think in particular for the case of autonomous weapons, that's one of the main reasons why it's inappropriate to delegate the authority to use a weapon or fire a weapon to a machine that really can't do those micro adjustments to specific contexts and situations. Um, on the other hand, what what happens when you have enough data about specific situations is now you can start to draw better and better inferences over it. So the question again is whether you can get enough data from surgery and surgery data in that case that you can cover the range of variability in specific surgery cases because surgeons have to do very specific things to accommodate people's uh, particular 
molecular biology, but if you're able to model all of that efficiently and robustly, which means having enough data to cover everything, then you can start to get at that kind of problem. I and mean, it was similar with cars. It was cars going to drive on a lot of different surfaces. So the, the, color, you know, the color of the road changes. The road gets wet. The roads aren't painted the same all the time. So it's very hard to create a definite set of assumptions about road conditions. But as you have enough data and, and can model the situation in enough detail, you can start to automate that process. Uh, I'm sorry, Peter. I think that we lost you there. Are you still there? Yeah, I, I lost you. Okay. Too. Okay. So, I'm sorry about that. We lost the last part of your answer. Uh, well, I'm just, as, and I th I'm you have a, then you can start to model things and, and try to cover some of it. But there's always eventualities, and that's one of the biggest problems with AI. Is rigidity. So I think some of these neural models might prove to be more robust um, if they're successful. Okay, thank you. I have also a question from Professor Steve Ferber. Steve, I think, uh, can ask the question himself. Okay, am I online? Yes, you are. Yeah, okay, um, so it's just an observation that, that um, we tend to think of autonomous weapons as being a sort of a new development resulting from AI, uh, but, but I observe that there have been various forms of autonomous weapon around for a, a century or so. Um, the, the example that springs to mind is the simple landmine, um, which uh, uh, decides using some kind of fairly simple internal algorithm when it's going to explode uh, in a rather non-discriminating way. Um, so maybe autonomous weapons aren't such a new problem, it's just that they seem more fearful when they become mobile. Anyone who would like to respond to this question? Sure. Uh, yeah, so I often use them as an example of a very simple or primitive autonomous weapon. And there the problem is very much about their lack of discrimination, and that's why we have an international prohibition on them now. Um, and they have disproportionate effects on civilians, you know, often long after conflict. Um, but many of the people who argued not to have a ban argued that if we made them smarter, they would be more discriminant and thus more acceptable. Um, I think there's other issues that arise, and I think mobility and the complexity that comes with having systems that are able to engage, you know, a complex world and have to deal with the contingencies of a complex world introduces a, a whole range of uncertainty that makes them much more difficult and less safe and, and raises a whole set of other issues. But uh, I agree with you on that. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I'm not sure if any, everyone in the audience has uh, noticed, but we have an account called uh, Questions. Well, it has a zero at the beginning of it, so it's on the top of the list. And if you have, if you would like to ask a question, you can just uh, write in the in the chat. I would like to ask a question. Otherwise, I would invite you now to uh, to ask a question to either to Peter or to Anna, or maybe you would like. Uh, Steve Ferber to explain a bit more about uh, his point. Yeah. Hello, this is Ben Starr. Can I ask a question? Right. Yes, go ahead. Okay, my, my question uh, refers back to the exchange between um, Anna and our presenter earlier, namely uh, the, the question of um, what is the HPP actually going to do? What's the difference going to be that the HPP makes? Um, so we've had a long, I mean, that there's a long science fiction history of um, intelligent machines that do all sorts of good or bad things. 
Uh, at this point, it's not clear to me uh, whether and in what way the HPP is actually going to make a significant difference to those um, science fiction scenarios becoming real or not. And my question, um, well, probably to everybody here, is how do we decide uh, what we think is relevant with regards uh, to the HPP and what do we leave in the realm of, of science fiction or, or, or wait for, for the future to unfold? Good question. Thank you, Bernd. Anyone who feels like they would like to take at least a first try at this question? So uh, this is this is Steve Ferber again. Um, I mean, my take on this is is that we we really won't make the kind of breakthroughs in intelligent systems until we have a much better understanding of the nature of natural intelligence. Um, my my view on on the sort of difficulty of of developing at, um, artificial general intelligence is that that uh, we're held back by not understanding natural intelligence. We don't know if 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 uh, aspects of natural intelligence such as self awareness and consciousness are sort of emergent properties of simple neural systems, or if there's something much deeper going on. Um, until we know those answers, then I think it's a very, the, the question is very hard to answer. Thank you very much. What about you, Bernd? Do you uh, have an answer yourself? No, no, no. <laughs> I don't. It's a genuine question. And I think Steve's, I agree with Steve's point there. I think um, that makes sense. But from a practical perspective, the question would, would still then be, when do we know that we have a sufficient understanding of natural intelligence that we can start worrying about artificial intelligence? So, so, so what's the threshold? At what point does this become something that requires action? And up to what point can we safely say, yeah, we don't really need to worry about it at this point? Yeah. It's a very hard balance, I guess, to uh, try to strike. Peter, do you have uh, any comments? Yeah, I was just going to kind of add that, um, reiterate the point that Nick Rose made earlier about um, tacit knowledge and, and dealing with unexpected contingencies. I think I think there's also a lot of variability in human brains. <laughs> so, I mean, it's it's great to have an idea single idealized model of the human brain, but I think the brain project itself might find that actually the human brains vary quite a bit, um, and and that's a good thing. Um, they, they have different kinds of experiences, and they have different kinds of skills, and um, that maybe can't be simulated so straightforwardly uh, in certain kinds of artificial systems, or require the kind of experience and training that actual humans and experts Thank you for that insight. We all uh, unique and different, and not very easily made into machines. I, um, I have a question from uh, Mark Oliver Veltic. Uh, Mark, you can just unmute yourself and uh, ask the question. Okay, this is uh, Mark Oliver. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Okay, so what I, I think it's it's very um, difficult to talk about the effects of, of research in general, and maybe it is useful to look into the different stages that it takes for whatever technology to develop into something where we have to watch more closely. Um, so typically you have a research stage where people don't really know what is going to happen. Yeah, they're just researching. And then you have an engineering stage where people are picking up the research and doing products. And then you have a deployment stage where the product is, is actually being used for certain things. So, for example, in a lot of the examples we heard in Peter's talk, we had deployed systems that turned you know, problematic in some, some way. And if we look at the pharmaceutical industry, for example, where things are extremely regulated, even at the research stage, I think the broader question is, um, is artificial intelligence research something where we have to already start worrying at the research stage, or is it something where we have to regulate the the product development stage, or is it something where where we are just at the stage where we have to worry about how the products 
are going to be deployed or if they are going to be deployed for certain purposes. That was my, my comment on this. So I don't have an answer for that, of course. Well, I think the floor is open to uh, Peter or to Anna if they would like to comment. Um, if Anna wants to jump in, please do. Uh, I think in the autonomous weapons, um, the way we're framing it is, is really about development and deployment. So we don't want to stifle research, even, even research that can have dual use applications in that domain because it's so broad. Um, many of the basic learning algorithms and control functions and autonomy itself in a, in a robotic system has a lot of useful applications as well. Uh, and I think more generally for AI, that would be the best way to proceed. You don't want to over-regulate or regulate at all basic research, um, but you do want to be concerned about how things are being applied and deployed and policy and regulation at that level. So it's fine to develop self-driving cars all you want on a you know test track, but when you start putting them on the road with human drivers and pedestrians, then you have a different situation. Uh, there is some discussion in um, the concerns over superintelligence or the singularity if we actually get AI systems that are advanced enough um, that they can somehow, you know, get it out, get loose onto the internet uh, and, and fall outside of human control. And I think if you get to the point of research where that's a possibility, then, then we might have to sort of step back and treat it more like some of the advanced research in, in biology uh, where you really need a very special set of safeguards to prevent biological agents from getting out into the natural world or say genetically modified organisms and things like that. Um, but I don't I don't think we're very close to that at this stage. Okay, Peter, thank you very much uh, for that comment. I'm holding my breath because I was waiting to see if anyone else wanted to comment on what you said. If that's not the case, then I think we will move to the next uh, speaker, which is uh, Ellen Winfield.